I have a challenge for you. Actually, I have a thought that I've been thinking about. What if Jesus came in his fullness and his glory, and he said, Leif, or he mentioned your name, I would like to borrow your body for one week. I'm going to fill you up with myself. My feet would be your feet. My hands would be your hands. My eyes would be your eyes. When you're looking at people, you wouldn't see them just the way they are, but how they would be. You wouldn't treat people based upon their history, but their destiny. Now, when you start to touch the sick, they would get well. When you would walk into a room, everything changed. First of all, Leif, do you think there would be any difference in the way that you were living and loving if Jesus in his fullness and his glory filled you up with himself, you were filled with his spirit? Would it be any difference in my marriage to Jennifer? Or would it be any difference in your marriage? If you were a parent, would you be a more patient parent? Even in traffic in Atlanta, would it be any difference on my way even towards this filming hour? I tell you something, I realized I started to make a list of different things that I know and it would be noticed from everyone around me. There would be such an upgrade for people to work together with me. The people in my office, they will have a different boss. The people on the airplane would have recognized a difference when his presence was filling that plane. And when I'm going to the nations on a trip, people will be loved differently. They would be actually uh, encouraged on a whole different level than I am doing today. And as I was meditating on that, then I was thinking that Jesus, when he called his disciples, ordinary people, to be with him, him. And as they were just being with him, they were becoming like him. And as they were becoming like him, he suddenly says these radical things. He said, as I have loved you, you're going to love one another. And that's how the world is going to see who we are. And then he says something else. It's actually going to be better that I go away. Because when I go away, I'm going to send you a comforter, a paraclete, a counselor, someone that goes alongside you. You're going to do the same things that I did. And even greater things. And when I'm hearing that, I'm thinking, Jesus, could we start with the same thing? This greater things makes me a little bit nervous. And these disciples that was together with him, here a Sunday came along, and this was going to kind of be the highlight after about three years of being with Jesus, watching him touching the lepers, ruin every funeral that he attended, especially Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. I'm so glad that he mentioned Lazarus, if not the whole graveyard, and every dead body would have come forth. It is amazing to have been with Jesus. And now finally, the king has arrived, riding into Jerusalem, and they are waiting for that kingdom that he has talked about. But Jesus does something very different. The very king and the kingdom look very different than they thought. And then there is that Thursday. Wow, the communion, the washing of the feet. And eventually, they started to head towards Friday. Wow, I don't know if you've had any Friday moments in your life, but I want to encourage you, Sunday is coming. And today's topic, we are talking about knowing who you are in Christ, knowing who Christ is in you, the Christ in you that's going to be the hope of glory around you. But to setting this stage, when they got to the Friday and the cross was there, and the, the one that is innocent, was taken by the Romans and went to the most horrific torture, the horrific crime that has ever been committed in world's history. He was crucified. The one that was innocent became guilty. The one that was without sin became sin so that we can become the righteousness of God in Christ. He took our shame so that we could be glorified. He took our sickness and our disease so by his stripes we are healed. Jesus on the cross, he took our fear so we could experience his perfect love. He actually became an orphan for a moment. He said, Eli, 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 lama sabatani. My God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just for a moment, he was set 
separated from perfect love. The perfect love he had had in union with his father. He was separated for a moment so that you and I can be restored back again to that perfect love. Then he was buried, and on the third day he rose again. And first of all, only John was there at the cross. Where are the rest of them when things is tough and difficult? I tell you where they were? In a upper room. And they were hiding, probably having their masks on because there was a fear virus everywhere. They were quarantined in the upper room. What were they doing there? The Bible is clear in John chapter 20, verse 19 to 23. I wanted to give this as a little framework for the first part of this session. It is some of my life verses. It's changed me. It's transformed me. It has made me look and love more like Jesus. These disciples, they wanted to live for him. But I want to challenge you. It's an impossibility to live the Christian life. Actually, he never called us to live it. He actually chose, he chose just ordinary people like you and I to live his life in and through us. He wants to fill us with himself. So the purpose of the filling is the spilling. And these disciples in this room, according to John chapter 20, verse 19, they were crippled in fear. And then the Bible says, Jesus just comes and he appears in this room and he fills that room with himself. He fills that room with his presence. Oh, if we're going to be like Jesus, to love like Jesus, to be one with Jesus, we need to be filled with his presence. His presence changes everything. And then Jesus does something. He says, peace be on you. Peace to you. Peace to you, Peter. Peace to you, and peace to you. He imparted his peace. So first, his presence just fills that room. And then from his presence, there is peace. And then he shows them his hands and his side, which is his provision. Anything they need, he says, I am. I am that I am. Look at my hands and my side. If you are sick, I am your healer. If you have lack, I am your provision. I am your abundance. If you're weak, he says, I am your strength. Whatever you need, look at my hands and my side. I took care of that. That's a name. That's an identity. It's an I am statement. It is a covenant statement. So from his presence, they were filled with his peace. And they were filled with his provision. And the Bible says, they became glad. They got a new passion. Whoa, they became glad. From sadness and sorrow and darkness, the room was filled with light. The room was filled with love. It was full of passion. And with that passion, he's released another round of peace. He says, peace on you. And with that peace, he gave them a new purpose. First, there was the alignment, full of his presence. And you're going to be filled with his presence, full of his peace. They got full of his peace, full of his provision. Look at his hands on his side, full of his passion. And then having his purpose, he says, as the Father sent me, I also send you. Now you are going to represent me. Wow, just as I represented the Father, you're going to represent the Father. So the world out there is going to see the Father of love, the Father of light, a good Father, the very Father that I represented to the world. You're going to be the same representative. And I'm sure that with this new purpose, they were looking at each other. That's impossible, Jesus. Of course it is. So he gives them a new power to go along with that. He breathes on them and says, receive, receive, receive the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and then the last thing here is the perspective and the paradigm. He said, if you forgive the sins of any, they will be forgiven. But if you retain the sins of any, they will be retained. That was verse 23. So let's just get a little simple outline of this. Here the disciples, ordinary people, they got filled with his presence. Then they got filled with his peace. They got filled with his provision. Then they got filled with his passion. And then they got filled again with his peace. From peace to you, to peace with you. And then from that very place, they got filled with his purpose. They had a purpose-driven life. They woke up in the morning now with a new purpose. They were living and loving for something bigger than themselves. They 
are a representative of the Father, just like Jesus was. And with that purpose, they got an upgrade in power. He breathed at them and gave them the Holy Spirit on the inside, the Christ in them that's going to be the hope of glory around them. And with that, they got a new perspective, a new paradigm. They now could change the environment of the world around them because their environment has changed. They were no longer checking the temperature like they did a few days earlier. They had become thermostats believer and later on the spirit also came upon them with a power to live the Jesus life so congratulations we're going to enter in to be able to know who you are in him and who he is in you and for you and I to be able to live and love just like Jesus. So the people around us, oh, we're going to make it hard for people to go to hell and easy for people to go to heaven when they're encountering the true Jesus, the Christ in you, that is going to be the hope of glory around you. I am who Jesus says that I am. And I have what Jesus says that I have. And I can do what Jesus says that I can do. For me, it has been a phenomenal journey to find out who I am in Jesus Christ. It was very important for me to know that when Jesus died, I died with him. When he was buried, I was buried with him. When he was raised from the dead, I was raised with him. And I become a new creation. The old life was passed away and something became new. Galatians 2.20 talks about that I've been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live is in him. It is for him. It is through him. It all comes from from him, it goes through him, and it goes back to him. So congratulations. This is the new life that we have in Jesus Christ. I have a friend that was a missionary for quite a few years, and he was describing to me that he was trying to overcome an addiction to pornography he had had for 12 years on the mission field. Several times he even got caught, and it affected his marriage, of course, and he went to counseling, and he tried all kinds of things, but this monster came back. But he started actually to look at the finished work of Jesus Jesus on the cross, but it was a revelation that took place this time. It was not just a head knowledge, it was an encounter where that person, I call him Johnny, when Johnny himself with all of his addiction went to the cross with Jesus. That old Johnny the, the, with the perversion and some of the abuse he had gone through in his childhood, all of that died on the cross. That old porn addict was buried with Jesus and he was raised up as a brand new person in Jesus where he was suddenly now pure, he was holy. And he started to go through the renewal process of his mind. And that's what I wanted to take a few moments and just making some of those scripture verses that my friend Johnny, that we took him through. First of all, the first important I am statement is that I am accepted. Did you know that you are accepted? My friend Johnny was accepted. Even at his worst moments, he was accepted. And then I thought about, as I was thinking about the acceptance, uh, I, I thought about the times in my life where I, I, I have forgotten who I am. I remember one time I complained to the Lord and said, I, I just felt that I got humiliated. And then the Lord remind me, says, Leif, how can you humiliate somebody that is humble? And I realized the only reason I got humiliated and felt humiliated was because there was still some pride in my life. Another time, somebody hurt me, and I kind of was complaining to the Lord, and I said, I, I really feel hurt over that. And, and he said, Leif, why do you feel hurt if you are dead? How do you hurt the dead person? And I realized that there was some of my pride again that had to die. And it is beautiful. It is beautiful when you're becoming free, when you know who you are in Him and who He is in you. And this is some radical, radical things from the Word of God. So I am accepted. I want you to say it for 30 days on a daily basis, this I am statement. The Bible says in John 1, 12, that I am God's child. You are God's son and daughter. John 15, 15, as a disciple, 
I am a friend of Jesus Christ. I love when he says, you're no longer a servant, but I call you my friend. Romans 5, 1 says that I have been justified with Christ. That means you have been declared righteous. That means that when God looks at you, it is just like you had never sinned. Do you see you that way when you look in the mirror in the morning and you're going to get some of these declarations in your life and you're going to do what my friend Johnny did. It doesn't matter if it is sickness or disease or if it is poverty or pain or relationship issue. Just go through this process of a renewed mind, coming into an agreement with what God says about you, coming into the identity of who you are in Jesus and who he is in you. First Corinthians 6, 17, it says that I'm united with the Lord and I am one with him in spirit. Wow, I'm one with him in spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20. I have been bought with a price, and I belong to God. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says that I'm a member of Christ's body. And Ephesians 1, verse 3 to 8 says that I have been chosen by God, and I have been adopted as a child. Can you see that you are accepted? Or say it again, I am accepted. Colossians 2, verse 9 to 10, I am complete in Christ. The completeness, you have an A plus on your report card before you take the exam because you are in Christ. And when God looks at you, wow, he has already accepted you because you are his beloved. Hebrews 4, verse 14 to 16, I have direct access to the throne of grace through Christ Jesus. So that was the first declaration, I am accepted. The second part that my friend went through and I'm going through, I am secure. There's a lot of insecurity, especially what is taking place in the world. But Romans 8 verse 1 to 2 says that I'm free from condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8 28 says that I'm assured that God works for my good in all circumstances. So if you have anything bad happen to you, wow, I have some good news for you. God is going to use all of the things, both the good, bad, and the ugly. He used it for good because you love him and you're called according to his purpose. You can have security no matter what happens in your life, that God is going to turn that around. I call it a turnaround anointing. Romans 8, verse 31 to 39, I am free from any condemnation brought against me, and I cannot be separated from the love of God. Isn't that exciting that nothing can separate you from the love of God? Not your behaviors, not other people's behaviors. There's absolutely nothing. Wow, that makes me secure. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21 to 22. I have been established, anointed, and sealed by God. Colossians 3, verse 1 and 4. I am hidden with Christ in God. Philippians 1, 6. I am confident that God will complete the good work he started in me. Philippians 3.20, I'm a citizen of heaven. I have a Norwegian passport, actually two Norwegian passports. I'm getting an American passport, but I have another passport, and that says that heaven is my home. I'm just visiting Norway, visiting America, and a lot of other places. I'm just an ambassador of heaven here on earth. But my security is that I have another home, and that home, wow, there is no sickness, there's no pain, there is no poverty, there is no political division. No, heaven is my home. Home. And that's my homeland. And sometimes I get homesick when I'm down here on earth. But I can handle this uh, temporary time down here as long as I know what I belong to and who I represent. Second Timothy 1 7, I have not given a spirit of fear. I have not been given a spirit of fear, but I've been given a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind, meaning fear doesn't belong to me. It's not in my account. When I open my account, it's full of power, love, and wisdom that comes from having peace and a sound mind. And 1 John 5, 18 says, I am born of God, and the evil one cannot touch me. Congratulations. First of all, say, I am accepted. Then I am secure. And the third one we are looking at in this segment is I am significant. These three areas of declaration is going to lead 
to transformation. You in Christ, Christ in you, is going to change the wall that is around you. John 15, 5, I am a branch of Jesus Christ, the true vine and the channel of his life. That makes me significant, knowing this Norwegian body that has been broken and going through all kinds of issues. Out of this life, his life flows. When I'm thirsty, I just start to drink, and from my innermost being, there's rivers of life that starts to flow, and it brings healing and life to the people around me. But I'm in Christ, and Christ is in me, and he uses the analogy of the wine and the branches, and out of my life, there's a lot of fruit, a lot of love, joy, peace, patience, Guess who gets the taste of that? My wife, my kids, the people that work around me, and even the people when I'm going around, I am a carrier of fruit, much fruit. And he prunes us and we can carry even more and more. That gives me significance. John 15, 16, it says that I had been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. Wow chosen and appointed to bear much fruit. 1 Corinthians 3.16 said, I am God's temple, meaning the very God that created the universe is living in this body, and I am a temple for the Holy Spirit to dwell. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 to 21, it says that I am a minister of reconciliation of God. Just imagine that. That should make you significant, that you as a priest, you are a royal priest. That means that there is a prince and a princess in you, but there is also another side. You're also a priest, and the priestly realm is that you get to represent God before people and people before God because you are in Christ and Christ is in you, and you do not hold the sins against people. It's amazing that no matter what issue people have, that you can and stand between them and God, and you can bring reconciliation. What a power. And this should get you to wake up every morning feeling as the most significant person on the earth. It doesn't matter if you are working a film crew or if you're writing a book or whatever you do, you do it as unto the Lord, knowing what you do is bringing reconciliation to restore people so they can find peace with God, peace with themselves, and peace with the world so they can walk out that peace as peacemakers because the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers makers. They are the sons and daughters of God. And then Ephesians 2, 6, wow, I am seated. I am seated with Jesus Christ in the heavenly realm. That's a good chair to sit in. That's where you're resting in the heavenly, resting in the heaven so that you can actually you can actually wear the enemy out here on earth because you are seated with Christ. He has a place with you right by the side of him. There you are. I'm also Ephesians 2.10. I am God's workmanship. And Ephesians 3.12. I may approach God in freedom and confidence. Oh, this gives me significance. And in Philippians, this is the last 4 verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I am accepted, <laughs> I am secure, and I am significant, and so are you. 30 days, we're gonna go through this journey of seeing who you are. So you look in that mirror and you see, think, feel, say. You see you the way he sees you. You renew your mind with his words. So you start to think about you the way he thinks. Then you start to love you the way that he loves. And then you speak out loud for 30 days, I am accepted, I am secure, and I am significant. And you're going to start to live a significant lifestyle, and you're going to be a difference maker. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The New Testament starts after about 400 years of silence. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the son of Abraham, the son of David. Wow, the son of Abraham, who was that? Isaac. Who was that? He was the sacrificial lamb that he was willing to lay down. It represents the lamb aspect of Jesus. And then it was the son of David. Solomon represents the lion. One had to do with the identity, and the one had to do with authority. One is a picture of a lamb, and one has to do with a lion. So when you're looking at the identity of Jesus, Jesus is a lamb, and he is a lion. He's the lamb of God, but he is also the lion of the tribe of Judah. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is 24 times lamb, and only one time lion. Why is this a 
important as we are finding out who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us. I was thinking about John as we're going to finish off this chapter, and that is John himself. He was known as a son of thunder. He probably had a little temperament uh, problem. Jesus actually called his two disciples, the sons of thunder, as a little calling name after they wanted fire from heaven to actually destroy the ones that wouldn't receive or accept Jesus. So in the middle of all of that, the way Jesus started a journey with John, John was a lion and he roared and he wanted fire. But then when he started to hang around the lamb, Jesus the lamb, something in his nature started to change. And eventually we know the journey. John was the only one at the cross. John was there at the resurrection. But it was one moment that I want us to capture today. And I feel it is so much connected to our identity of who you are in Christ, but also who Christ Christ is in you, so that Christ in you, the hope of glory, can be revealed. John had something that nobody else had. Jesus had multitudes around himself. He had 72. He sent them out two and two to be able to heal the sick, to set the captives free. Jesus also had a 12 that was more a covenantal relationship. They kind of was his spiritual sons and daughters. They were his disciples. And then among the 12, he had the three, the Peter, James, John. They had experiences. The 12 or the 72 or the multitudes didn't have with Jesus. And then Jesus had the one. And I never forgot that the picture when Jesus at the cross, I mean, he's waiting. He's just waiting to go home to the Father. He had been tortured for so long. There was something that was holding him back. And when I notice when Jesus is looking at his mama, and he says, Behold, mother, this is your son. Behold, son, this is your mother. And at that moment, John changed his apostolic calendar, and he took care of what was most valuable to Jesus. Jesus knew he could die, and he could finish his assignment, because he had someone that had captured the fullness of his heart, that knew how to be a lamb just like Jesus, that knew how to love just like Jesus, that knew how to love Jesus' mother just like Jesus would love his mother. Why was it not Jesus' half-brother? Why was it not some of the family member according to the tradition? Why was John the one that was entrusted with what's the most valuable? When you read the book of Matthew, you never find Matthew says, I'm the one that he loves. Read the book of Mark. Mark never says, I'm the one or whom the disciple Jesus loved. Uh, Dr. Luke, who wrote uh, both the book of Luke, but also the book of Acts. He never says, I'm the disciple whom he loved. And he is very intellectual. But when you get to John, five times John, and John says it about John, I am the one that he loved, to whom the disciple Jesus loved standing by. And here is the picture of John. What was it about John? Why would John, in the book of John, say about John five different times that he is the favored one? I'm the one that he loves. In my culture, we don't do that. And perhaps, maybe not in your culture, if you're in a room full of people to kind of say that I'm the disciple whom he loved. But if you had captured what John captured and understood your identity of who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you, if you loved you the way that Jesus loved you, not just how much Jesus loves you, but you love you the way that he loves you because you are totally one with him. The oneness, the union that you have together with him. That's a covenantal thing. That means that you have become one. That's why John was entrusted to take care of what is the most valuable to Jesus. So can you be entrusted to take care of what is the most valuable to him? Would you be the one of all the people that would be chosen to take care of Jesus' mother? Here is a couple of things. He knew his identity. He knew who he was and whose he was. He knew that I am the disciple who Jesus loved. John loved John the way that Jesus loved John. Peter knew how much Jesus loved him, but it was something in Peter that Peter has not yet 
come into the same oneness that John had with Jesus. Would John love John the way Jesus loved John? This is not just a sovereignty, but it is according to how comfortable you are with love, because God is love. And when you get comfortable with love, you get comfortable with God. And both his wholeness and his holiness has all to do with the depths, width, and the length, and the height of that love. And John had stepped into that ocean of love, be set free from himself, so he could start to move and live and have his being. Intimacy. John in the upper room, he leaned into Jesus' bosom. He was comfortable with intimacy. And one moment when Jesus says, one of you about to betray me, everybody is looking in the room like, who is it? I could see Peter getting ready for the sword. But Jesus didn't give the answer to the ones with a sword. He gave the answer to John, who put his head into Jesus' chest, leaned into his bosom. John's ear was warmed with the heartbeat of his lover. His heartbeat with his heartbeat. Intimacy. How comfortable are you with intimacy? When everybody has questioned what's going on, do you know how to lean into him and capture his heartbeat in what is taking place? And do you know how to find the rhythm of your heart to flow with his heart so that everything that you do and say will be from his heart because you have captured the lamb. And when you then start to roar as a lion, you suddenly gathering people instead of scattering people because it comes from the lamb's heart. John was there at the crucifixion. That means the fellowship of his suffering. When things are difficult and it is hard, are you still going to be there? Or do you run off for? Perhaps try to find some other lovers if you didn't feel this works out. John continued to wait for the resurrection. Are you willing to, no matter if you've had a long Friday moment, it looks like everything is dying in your life, to continue to wait until Sunday is coming? John was taking care, and John wanted to be the one that was steward to take care of what was the most valuable to Jesus. And the last thing, John was entrusted with the future of the things to come. Oh, Jesus is looking for you and for me to be able to be so one in him, just like John, for you to love you the way that he love you, that covenant, that oneness, so that he can entrust you with the future of the things to come. Congratulations, your upgrade is confirmed.